If you want to know the difference in people's lives, it all comes down to what are the things that are the must for you versus shoulds. So let me tell you this. We said to have an extraordinary life, you got to have an extraordinary psychology, right? Extraordinary psychology means you got to live in an extraordinary state. To be in an extraordinary state, you got to condition your nervous system, your body, your physiology and focus to be at their best. Do you agree with this? Yes or no? Then to do that, though, you can do that. Why doesn't everybody? It's not because you can't. We all have the ability. It's because of our standards. I remember a time early in my career, I was about 24, and I went to do a seminar in Boston. And in those days, a big seminar for me was like 125 people. And it was a three-day seminar, and we worked around the clock, and people made such extraordinary changes in their life. And at the end of it, I was feeling so fulfilled. I was thinking, my God, I'm 24, maybe 25 at the time. And I am so happy because I, I have found my mission in life. I'm doing what I love. It's making a difference in people's lives. This is extraordinary. So we finished about midnight on the Sunday night. And around midnight, you know, I'm still wound up, so I don't feel like going to bed. So I decided, okay, you know, let me take a walk here. And I decided to go through Copley Square. If you've been through Copley Square, you know, it's a pretty neat place. Because in Copley Square, you can look up and you can see buildings that were here before we were known as the United States. And beside them, you see skyscrapers that are new. It's a pretty cool place. So I'm walking around midnight on Sunday night. There's nobody in Copley Square midnight on Sunday night. And I'm walking along, and I see this guy in the distance, and he's kind of stumbling back and forth between the gutter and the sidewalk. He had a long trench coat on, his head's down like this. He's holding a brown bag. And I can start to smell him even before I get there. And I'm thinking, you know, this guy's obviously drunk. And as I started to get closer, I thought, I bet he's going to beg me for some money. And sure enough, whatever you focus on life tends to happen, doesn't it? So sure enough, he gets real close to me. And I thought all of a sudden he wasn't going to do it. And all of a sudden he popped his head up. It was really weird. He went, Mister! He had this really bizarre looking sounding voice. He went, Mister! Could you loan me quarter? And I thought, do I want to reward this behavior? And then I thought, I don't want him to suffer. Do you have this dilemma sometimes? Like, you know, I'm not here to judge. So years ago, I finally decided I always just give. Even the person's pulling a scam, that's for them to deal with. If I have the ability, then I give. And so I thought, but could I teach him something? So I asked him a question back. I said, is that all you want is a quarter? So he goes, yeah, just one quarter. One quarter changed my whole life, one quarter. I said, really? He said, yeah, one quarter. So I reached in my pocket, and I pulled out my money clip. And in those days, I was you know, very young, just starting to succeed. And my original mentor was a man named Jim Rohn. I don't know. How many have heard of Jim Rohn? Anybody? Yeah, he's a great guy. And Jim told me, he said, Tony, look, you've come from a poor background. You've got a poor psychology. You've got to change it. He said, you don't have any money, so pretend you do. He said, start training your brain. Condition it. He said, go save all your money, get $300 bills, and put them on the outside of your money clip, even though you only have five bucks in between them. So every time you put it out, you'll see that, you'll feel inspired, you'll feel better. He said, and you'll feel better, you'll do better. So I was like, okay. So I did. So I pulled my money clip, and sure enough, I got $300 bills down. I made sure he saw the bills. So I'm tearing through that, right? Looking in between there, see if I can find some change. But I made sure he saw it. Sure enough, he's looking at the $100 bills, checking it out. I find the quarter, I pull it out, take the money, put it in my pocket. I notice he's watching my hand going into the pocket. I took the quarter, and I looked at him, and I said, sir, Life will pay any price you ask of it. And I gave him the quarter. And then something really interesting happened. He took the quarter. He looked at the quarter. He looked at me. He looked at my pocket. He looked back at the quarter, looked at me, looked at my pocket, looked at me again, looked at the quarter, looked at my pocket, looked back at me and said, you're weird. <laughs> and then he shuffled on off like this, right? And I thought to myself, wow, what's the difference between him and me? I mean, I was 24, 25 at the time, doing what I love most, have my mission in life, and he's in his early 60s, drunk on the street, begging for quarters. What's the difference? And I thought, well, maybe God's blessed me because I'm such a good person. I thought, oh, that's, and he's such a bad person, that's such bull. And I thought, wow, maybe the answer to that question is what I just told him. Life will pay whatever price you ask of it. But you know what's interesting? You've got to ask intelligently. In the Bible, it says, ask and you shall what? Yeah, pretty good formula. You ought to look into it. But you know what? It says, ask and you shall receive, but I'm sure it meant ask intelligently. I'm sure that's what God meant. I'm sure he didn't mean bitch and you will receive. 
wine and you will receive. I don't think that was the instruction. Now, if you were going to ask intelligently, there might be five elements of that. Number one, you'd have to ask specifically, wouldn't you? You wouldn't ask in a general way. People do it all the time. They go, I want more money. Fine, here's a dollar. Get out of here. <laughs> Very often, you're getting what you're asking for. You're just not aware of how general you're asking. Clarity is power. The more clear you are about exactly what it is you want, the more your brain knows how to get there. Your brain is a servo mechanism. It's like a bomb. Those bombs, those missiles, they have a servo mechanism. So if the target moves, it knows what the target is. It follows it. Your brain, when you condition it, knows exactly what to go for, and it'll find a way to get there. Do you ever buy a certain outfit or a certain car and suddenly see that car outfit everywhere? How many of you ever had that experience? Say, I. How come that car outfit's everywhere? It always was everywhere, but now you notice it. And the reason is because there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system, the RAS. That part of your brain determines what you notice and what you don't notice. Your brain spends most of its time trying to make sure you don't notice because you'll go crazy if you notice everything. But when you decide what's most important to you, your brain goes after it. Everyone I know who's successful builds what I call an RPM plan. An RPM is built on the metaphor that the way to get from where you are to where do you want to go to the fastest is you've got to build power, like in a car, RPMs. And the R stands for they know the result they're after. They know what they want precisely. If you don't know exactly what you want or you let yourself get beyond that into something general, you're not going to achieve it. Clarity is power. You've got to know the specific result you're after. What do you want? If you can't answer that question right now in your personal life, in your body, in your relationships, in your finances, in your spirituality, then you're not going to be as fulfilled as you want to be. Today, we're going to have you answer one of those questions at least. The second part of it, you've got to know P, why you're doing it. Because you know what? You may get a big goal. So I want to make a billion dollars. I want to bring peace to the earth. Why? Because as soon as you come up with a goal, all the obstacles show up. And unless you've got enough emotional drive to break through that, you're never going to discover what it really takes. So you've got to get yourself past that. And when you get past that, is have enough reasons. Reasons come first, and answers come second. This man did not know what he wanted. He did not have enough reasons. To ask intelligently, you've got to ask specifically. To ask intelligently, you've got to know why you want it, have enough drive to make it happen, enough juice to make it happen. If you don't have enough reasons, you will not make it happen. And the M is, what is your massive action plan? What is going to get you to actually fall through? Because the first plan's not going to work, and the second plan's going to work, so you better have enough plans that if the first two don't work, you still got something else. Otherwise, you're going to be having excuses why it didn't work. So asking intelligently requires that. So if we're going to be extraordinary in our results, we've got to be in an extraordinary state. We've got to know what we want, and we've got to go use it. 